So, this will be the last lecture of this course artificial intelligence and in this lecture we will be dealing with uh, the remaining issues some of the issues of natural language processing. In the previous lecture on natural language processing we were trying to bring out some of the issues. Uh, we will dwell on the issues of machine translation a little bit today and then we will discuss natural language understanding. So, uh, today we will be discussing about the remaining part of natural language processing. To start with let us have a look at the issues that are involved in machine translation because we have seen that machine translation is a very key very important aspect of many natural language applications like speech to speech, text to speech, uh, even for text to speech from another language, information retrieval, cross language information retrieval, uh, machine translation becomes a very important issue. And right now in India, which is a multilingual country, a lot of effort is being expended um, towards development of machine translators. IIT Kanpur has developed a, a Angla Bharati a machine translation from English to Hindi <laughs> and uh, there are other efforts at different IITs like IIT Kharagpur and uh, CDAC where uh, machine translation activities are being carried out. Machine translation and also at IIIT Hyderabad uh, Shakti a machine translator has been developed. Now, when we talk about machine translation, it can be text to text machine translation. That means, say a text is given in Hindi and that is being translated in Bengali or it can be from speech to speech. So, speech to text and then machine translation at the text level and then again converting that to speech which we discussed in the last lecture. Now, most of the work that has been done has addressed pairs of widely spread languages like pairs of languages English French, English Chinese, English German. As I said English Hindi, we are working on English to Bengali that sort of activities have gone in. Right now works are also being carried out for Hindi to English, Hindi to Bengali and government of India has taken a lot of initiative in these activities. Now, how to translate a text? There are different approaches, uh, example based translations where we have got some templates and given a particular sentence we try to fit it to a template and that template will uh, tell us the best way to translate it. But the most commonly used approach is uh, <coughs> statistical where we learn again from the previously translated data. Now, where from can we get a pre get uh, translated data? For that we need a parallel corpora. What is a parallel corpora? A parallel corpora is a uh, collection of the pairwise sentences. For example, there is a English sentence and the corresponding Hindi translation of that. <coughs> and also that is a sentence wise, but also word level every word having its uh, translated form. So, it may appear to be very simple then, but it is not so because of the because of the several reasons which we discussed earlier in the earlier lecture. There are so many issues of resolving ambiguities uh, and other things. So, for French and English and for Chinese to English, there are required tools and there has been reasonable translation. So, when a translation is being done by a machine, we are not um, expecting uh, perfect translation. We are uh, not also right now thinking of uh, translating literature, uh, keeping the flavor which the human beings also cannot do most often. So, but if we just restrict ourselves to some routine uh, day to day sentences without special flavors, then we get reasonably good translations here. Uh, Chinese to Hindi for example, there are no such tools. Uh, there are efforts going on for translating for building corpora, uh, parallel corpora for English in the Bengali Hindi etcetera the works are on. Now, a major laborious task is uh, how to obtain the parallel texts.
can you get it from the web? In the web, most of the contents are uh, in English. So, how do you get uh, the contents from a uh, contents, the sa same contents in Hindi? That is difficult, but there are some uh, cases where we get parallel corpora in many government records where uh, those are also, the, those are stored both in Hindi and English. Uh, so, that may be one approach. Now, once we have the texts, how to get the most out of them? We have to do the word alignments oh, because, I mean, we have to really align the Hindi word with the corresponding English word. We have to obtain the proper lexicon and also we will have to import some knowledge from well studied language. As we will discuss a little later that in spite of all these techniques, the domain knowledge will be required and very helpful for better performance. Next, with this approach, I mean uh, with this overview of machine translation, <coughs> which is a very important uh, activity, we now move to the to another aspect of natural language processing that is natural language understanding. Now, understanding natural language is very important uh, because if we want to, you have, you have seen uh, the dialogue in my scene, right. So, that sort, that was not a very, in the very strict sense, that was not a natural language understanding program, but in a restricted sense, yes, because for the small domain, it interpreted in a particular way, in a very restricted format. But if we want to make a dialogue system, for example, I type in some query and the system will understand. It is not a quid, not the sort of query that we give, we give in Google. I can type in any natural language query. Like, like for example, what would be the best possible train if I would uh, like to go to Delhi, uh, maybe uh, through Agra or maybe through Allahabad, that sort of constructs. Now, if we type that thing in and uh, say, uh, let me modify the sentence a little bit, what would be the best way to go to from Delhi to uh, Bombay, possibly through Allahabad or possibly through some other place um, at a low cost. Now, we would like to have the system process this query, understanding what exactly I want and respond back to me. Now, natural languages can often be uh, very difficult uh, natural language understanding because uh, we will see why. Now, our objective is to make the computers react intelligently to human speech. Speech is the ultimate, but as an intermediate, we can assume that we are typing in text. Uh, this is the most natural interface to computers. For example, in database query, right now we type in standard uh, SQL query in the SQL language, but ultimately ultimate aim could be that I am just asking for the query. I am just giving a speech input, speech query and I am getting the answer or I am writing the query in a free format of English and I want the answer. Okay. Now, the research that uh, is involved in that belongs to two disciplines. One is AI who are focusing on developing programs that will react to language and linguistics. It is a discipline studying the human language use. Both of them, uh, both these uh, disciplines must collaborate hand in hand in order to get a good result. Verbal speech recognition that is related, but it also requires some digital signal processing and other things uh, where we have to extract the speech signals. Now, all natural, now one thing must be remembered that all natural languages are as complex as the other. There cannot be any language which is very simple and the other is very complex. Okay. And no natural language is best suited towards modeling or easier to process. And the vocabulary of the different languages are different and uh, that is because of the different social factors. Now, relatively easy to derive 
natural language parsers are uh, grammar for constrained English, but not for general English however, because in natural language we get a lot of flexibility. We can use some dictionary or lexicon of words and their grammatical usage. Grammar can both recognize and generate sentences. We can use grammar to do that. Another very important issue is to understand the meaning of the sentence, so semantics. That is much more complex. As we have shown earlier that parsing a sentence helps in some way to understand which part is the subject of the sentence, which part is the object and which one is the verb. As we had shown in the last lecture that uh, from the sentence I went to the bank to enjoy sunset, we could by syntactic method we could eliminate uh, the possibility of bank uh, from being uh, a verb like depend that was eliminated. Okay? But true understanding requires much more common sense knowledge, the relations, the context and all these issues. Say, if I just take this simple sentence, Mary ate spaghetti with George. All right. Now this and if I write Mary ate spaghetti with chopstick. Now what is the what is the difference between these two sentences? The structure is same x ate y with z that is the structure. But since George is a person then Mary basically it means Mary and George ate spaghetti together. Whereas, in the other case, Mary ate spaghetti using a, f a chopstick. So, what do we really mean by understanding a sentence? One way we can say that when we uh, listen to a sentence, we probably make a picturization, a perception of that. Maybe if we think of a large semantic net describing the world in our mind, some of the nodes of those semantic nets get activated and we get some subtree that may be one model. But still it is an open question what do we really mean by understanding a sentence. An indirect uh, way might be that if I really understand the sentence properly then I can reply to that or respond to that properly. <laughs> now we look at another sentence when the balloon touched the light bulb it broke what broke? A balloon touched the light bulb and the light bulb broke or is it when the balloon touched the light bulb, the balloon broke, okay? exploded because it uh, touched a hot light bulb. Now, how do you understand that? How the machine understand that? We immediately assume that the light bulb cannot be broken by the touch of a balloon, but it is the balloon that got broken, but for in order to understand this, we need so much of domain specific knowledge that are related that a balloon is a light object and a balloon cannot be, uh, a balloon is a light object and a balloon cannot break a light bulb which is a stronger object, etc. So, how do you go about it? Say, when again, when the balloon touched the light bulb, it broke. Now we are going to a discourse that is a set of sentences. This caused the baby to cry. Now what is this, this? The balloon caused or the event of the balloon getting broken caused the baby to cry. Obviously, as a human being we know that this, that the balloon got uh, broken that made the baby cry, right? But how do you know that? We know that because we have, we have got a domain knowledge which has got the information that a ba baby likes a balloon and if anything that is liked is broken, then the person feels sad. That may be stored in a semantic net or in some other form or maybe in the form of rules. Okay? Now you see another point that when the balloon touched the light bulb, it broke. Now if there was some ambiguity, if my system was a little hesitant to really 
decide on what broke, probably the second sentence actually helps to resolve this ambiguity in this case, but in some cases it can create further ambiguities as well. Mary gave John a dirty look and picked up the baby. Probably you can pictureize that John is the father and who probably let the balloon go and it touched the light bulb and it uh, broke. So, Mary the mother was really annoyed with John and John shrugged and picked the balloon. Now, what does it mean? Now, with this sentence, so you see there are so many scope, there is scope of interpretation, but we are interpreting it so naturally because of the deep knowledge of the domain or the world that we have with us. Now, let us see how the system uh, will react to some questions. Which one got broken? Suppose the system says balloon, all right. Who cried? The answer is baby. Was anyone angry? Now, say by the reasoning that I was just orally describing, <coughs> you where I expected the background knowledge to be there, I can get the answers and these answers are directly, these keywords are directly in this sentence. But was anyone angry? That is nowhere written that Mary was angry or John was angry, but that is subject to interpretation because Mary gave John a dirty look. And you see the deeper knowledge and the more complicated scenario we are going on, going in. That giving a dirty look implies that someone is angry. Now, the issue is in the real world, there are so many possibilities in a rule based system if you think of, can you really store all these possibilities? How much will you store? And can you ever make it complete? So, that makes the entire scenario very difficult and this is one side. Another side is natural language gradually evolves, new words are coming in, new phrases are coming in, new expressions are coming in, how to deal with that. That is why uh, there is an attempt to go towards statistical reasoning, statistical method, statistical learning and translation, which is helping to have a quick fix solution, though not always very correct, uh, but mostly it works fine. Did John care? John shrugged and picked the balloon. So, John probably cared more for the balloon and not for the baby, but that has to be inferred and this inference is quite complex. The next thing is say the same thing and was the light bulb hot? The answer is yes. Now, how did you get it yes? Now, here it is also subject to interpretation and inference because it is coming from the domain of physics or domain of the real world that a balloon when it touches a light bulb, a light bulb if on it was kept on then it is hot then only a balloon can break. All right? If the light bulb was off then obviously it did not break, but here whether the light bulb was on or off is not the issue. Since it broke I, we infer that must be the light bulb was hot. Was the balloon inflated? Yes. And how did you get that? Otherwise if it is not inflated how do you say that it broke? Was the balloon exploded? I mean that is another question. Was John, con John concerned? These are all subject to interpretation and complicated inference. Who was responsible for the baby crying? John? In a way yes, but actually the balloon was responsible, but since Mary gave John a dirty look, so it tells us that obviously John had something to do with the balloon going off and touching the light bulb. Okay? So, it is a much deeper inference that gives this answer John. So, so, if we say that we were trying to parse a paragraph, then all sentences we find are related to one another to different degrees and we have to denote the relationship among the components that we are getting after parsing the individual sentences. See first of all we are getting the components as words and we try, we try to find their part of speech. All right. But when these words uh, 
get embedded in a sentence, then also there are some ambiguities and we have to resolve them. And when now, now there, are, there is a paragraph. So, now we will have to discuss about inter sentence relationship. And maybe when we are going for a discourse consisting of a number of paragraphs, we will have to move, we have to establish inter paragraph relationships. So, in that way it gets complicated. And there, as we have shown that there are some implicit knowledge about the universe and thus knowledge representation is very crucial about the whole thing. See, early toy systems, such natural language systems were attempted for a long time. One of the well-known systems is ELISA. Okay. It pretends to be a psychologist and talks to the user. What does it do? It parses a sentence and looks for keywords and phrases. All right. User, for example, says, I feel angry today. Now, feel is a keyword that Eliza knows and feel, uh, so Eliza can therefore respond, tell me why you feel angry today. So, it takes this entire component, this entire uh, part of the sentence, feel angry today and just replaces I with you. So, you feel angry today and this is a very routine uh, mechanical way he is forming a question, tell me why you feel angry today. Actually, it is not deep understanding, but in a way it, it can fool the naive users and the naive users can uh, find it very interesting that Eliza is conversing to them. Now, in order to really build a good knowledge underst uh, understanding system, we require knowledge representation, we require knowledge structures we have to have some internal representations for representing the meanings of the sentences. We have to have some kind of inference generation. Okay. We have to do some syntax and semantic analysis. So, if we look at sentence analysis, here is a serial flow of control. We need many things, here only a few things are enlisted. All right. Say we have got an input sentence here that is undergoing syntactic analysis and for that we are using the grammar. Okay. This grammar is being used and consequently we are getting the parse tree. Okay. We are getting the parse tree as the output of this syntactic analysis. All right. And this is followed, this parse tree as we said at the syntactic level after doing some part of speech tagging, we can uh, handle or we can uh, deal with some of the semantic issues, but there are many more semantic issues which cannot be handled at this level. This is followed by semantic analysis and this is a complex problem <coughs> where we will be needing features of the domain. Okay. We will be needing features of the domain. And after that, we need some pragmatic analysis. Some things are really not possible to be uttered uh, in a particular context. Those are pragmatic considerations and all through this, we have to carry out inferences in order to have, in order to discover the meanings as we have shown uh, in the earlier example. I am sorry, where is uh, that uh, uh, that uh, balloon breaking issue. In that case, we have already uh, seen that we often need deep semantic understanding um, of and semantic, uh, we need a deeper inference to be carried out in order to understand because many of the things are implicit and uh, need to be inferred and often these inferences are quite complicated. All right. Now, the po point is that here we have shown a serial flow of control. Is the serial flow of control enough that I will first do syntactic analysis, then I will do semantic analysis, then pragmatic analysis, then I will do inferencing? Possibly not, not always. 
For example, if we look at these two sentences, just have a look at these two sentences. John took her flowers. Okay. John took her flowers. What does it mean? So, somebody brought some flowers and John took them. A stranger took her money. Now, this two takes are different. This is accepts and this is steals. Okay. A stranger stole her money. Now, semantics and context are used to resolve the syntactic ambiguities. Here is a printing mistake used to resolve this D should not be there the syntax syntactical ambiguities because here uh, you know this is uh, this is subject to interpretation. Say here when the balloon touched the light bulb it broke this caused the baby to cry. Mary gave John a dirty look and picked up the baby. John shrugged and picked the balloon. Now, we can observe that seven explicit information are given like the balloon was originally inflated, otherwise it would not have uh, the balloon broke. So, the light bulb was hot. Well, these are also not very explicit, they have uh, they have got some implicit some little bit of inference is required, but that is uh, quite straightforward. The balloon exploded that is straightway stated over here, but there also you see <coughs> it broke means what broke the bulb or the balloon that anaphora resolution was required to find the proper referent. The explosion made a loud noise, but this is inferred. This is all nowhere is said that there was a noise, but this caused the baby to cry might be the noise. The baby was scared that is relatively direct, crying may have a direct relationship with being scared. The loud noise scared the baby, Mary picked the baby to comfort it. Now, none of them are actually so much explicit, they require some sort of inferencing. Okay. Now, there have been different methods which have been proposed to uh, carry out the inferencing for natural language understanding. One way of doing that is the script uh, language, which uh, is very helpful to encode stereotypic event sequences. Say I went to a movie last night. Now, going to a movie is a very stereotype scenario, because all of we, all of us know that there are some routine things that we must do in order to go to a movie hall and see the movie. We must have money, we must go to the movie hall, we must get the ticket and in order to get the ticket we must have enough money, so that we can pay for the ticket. And after we get the ticket, we proceed towards the movie hall, we have to show the ticket to the usher and then we will have to go and sit in the movie hall and watch the movie. And so, when I come out of the movie hall, I also know that the amount of money that I had when I went in the movie hall. The, when I went out, the amount of money left will be less because I had to pay for the ticket. Now, this is a very stereotypic situation. Another very popular stereotypic situation is going to a restaurant. Now, when I go to a restaurant, then I must go to the restaurant. Before that, I must have money. I must go to the restaurant. I must find a seat in the restaurant. I will have to order food and I have to order the food, so that the cost of the food is less than the money that I have. After eating I have to pay for the food and when I come out, then I will have less amount of money. So, these are some very stereotypic situation as if a drama script has been written and whether I go to a restaurant or you go to a restaurant, 
or I, your friend goes to a movie, the steps that will be executed are very similar. So, such that is why this is called a script. So, as if we are following a script. So, here I went to if I say if I describe a stereotypic situation using the script language, then uh, as soon as I write that I went to a movie last night, you understand that I must have had money to buy a ticket that is possible to infer very easily. The ticket was purchased at the theatre or a movie hall. I may have had to wait in the line for a bit before I can go into the theatre. That is a typical uh, movie hall scenario, there is a queue and you may have to wait. You can further infer more, once inside the theatre I could have bought popcorn, candy or ice cream, typical things that are possible. You will not, uh, obviously will not assume that you have uh, inside the movie hall you will buy a chicken dish, all right. I exchanged the ticket with an usher who gave me a stub back, etcetera, 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 I can go on. So, that is the script language. Now, using this sort of script, if we look at this balloon script, here is a partial description of the balloon script. So, only a partial part. So, it po is possible that I blow up the balloon by mouth and tie the balloon or I could have pumped up the balloon with helium and then tied the balloon. After tying the balloon, a couple of things can happen. Either the balloon withers away, okay, the balloon explodes or the balloon flies away. In that way, we can describe the entire scenario. This is a very small part of balloon and we can go on building it a complete script of the drama if we consider what happened with the child John, Mary and the balloon being exploded as a drama, we can write down a script in the form of some specific language as is provided by the script language. But there are a couple of problems in this approach. First of all, the script that you write will be very uh, complicated and often very difficult to handle. Another issue is that uh, only script we find is often not enough. In order to understand the scenario, we have to have some basic idea of where we are trying to reach and uh, we have to, you have already learnt about planning. So, some sort of goal based planning is required, all right. But so there are uh, different levels of planning which will be which are often found useful to characterize stereotypic situations. Because if I go to a movie hall, I have got a complicated script over there, but my objective is to see the movie and get a set. And out of the possible uh, script actions that I would like to take, that I may possibly take, I will take the best one that will. Um, satisfy my goal faster. For example, just you want to go to the movie hall and you have got different ways of going. Now, in order to understand that suppose uh, a statement is there that I went to the movie hall um, yesterday night. I started from my home at in the evening. Uh, I reached the movie hall for the night show just 5 minutes before the show started and you go on saying different things. Now, if somebody asks why were you late and will the system be able to infer that he must have gone to the movie hall not by taking a taxi or a cab, but probably went by bicycle or by a slower uh, vehicle or slower route. because. And why, why would a person uh, choose a slower route? Must be he did not have enough money and he wanted to save money. If he had taken a cab, the amount of money that he would be left with would not be sufficient to buy a ticket. So, these are all inferences and these inferences might be you can write everything out in the script, but that is uh, that becomes very cumbersome. Instead, 
if we have got a plan and you apply the planning knowledge also over here, you will be in a better situation to handle it. So, the moral of the story is in order to build an effective system, script is one thing, the domain knowledge is another thing, maybe the semantic nets and all those things are required. We need the lexicon and maybe we need the planning structure and in that way there can be numerous things which will have to be used together in order to build an effective system. Next, uh, we will uh, discuss about a particular approach that is not a unique approach, but that is one of the approaches that are uh, found to be very useful in natural language understanding. That is known as case frames or semantic frames. Now, uh, you have been, you are exposed to the frame structure. Okay. Just to have a quick review, a frame is a data structure like a frame boy will consist of different slots like age, height, weight, name, etcetera. These are the slots and boy is um, easy and this is human, etcetera. And in age, since I am saying a boy, I can also have some constraint that the age can be any value between say uh, 5 to say 15, beyond which I will not call him a boy. So, when I instantiate the frame that Tom is a boy, then we create an instance of this frame where the, we talk about a particular boy Tom whose age will be say 10, the exact data of Tom may be 5 feet, weight may be 60 kilo, name is Tom, etcetera. That is a frame and we have also seen uh, that a frame uh, can be used for and these are the constraints that we can associate with the different slots and we have also seen the frame based inferencing how it is done. Now, uh, in the case of a natural language understanding, you see whenever I state make any sentence, the boy Uh, went to school. Now, if we take the verb and went is a past tense of go. So, we can create a frame go any verb and any verb we will have different slots and what these slots will be? One thing is, is that in this case it is, it can have different tenses, all right. But besides this, so in this case went will be an instance of go with past, all right. But going, the action of going will require or will generate, can generate the question who went. Let me not write agent right now. Let me say I can ask the questions which are relevant to going. What are the possible questions that I can ask? I can ask who went, where did he go, when, with whom. All these are possible questions that I can ask. Similarly, if I consider the verb give, then associated with give, I can have a number of queries like who gives, gives what, to whom, where, how, 
etc. Similarly, if I take the verb eat, then also I can have queries like who eats, eats what, where, okay. say with what, Tom ate spaghetti with chopstick, with what, etc. These are some very relevant queries that are associated with a particular verb. Those of you who have not forget, forgotten your school level training in Bengali or Hindi or Indian languages, you must have heard of the uh, of a thing which is called the karaka. Okay. In Indian language, we have got six karakas, all right. And these are basically one karaka, the karaka is determined by the relationship that a word has got with the verb. Like Tom went to school, who went to school? The answer is Tom. So that the answer, that is a nominative case in Indian language is Kartvi karak. Like that, so who, what, these are different roles or in English grammar, we also say these are different cases, karaka and case are the same thing. Okay. So, this sort of frames like the frame for eat, which starts with who eats, eats what etcetera. These are different cases okay. and that is why these are called the such frames are called case frames or they are also called semantic frames because in some way whenever we identify the karaka, we can answer, we can whenever we identify the case, we can uh, answer some of the questions like say say Mary ate spaghetti with chopstick right now this sentence and if I have got a verb eat then this particular verb will be an instance of this where the tense instance of eat where the tense will be passed, okay. who will be Mary, what will be spaghetti, with what will be chopstick. Now, when we have got this case frame instantiated, then obviously, if I ask the question, how did Mary eats spaghetti. The answer will be here, and so we can say that Mary ate spaghetti with chopstick. If we ask what did Mary eat, the answer will come directly from this slot of this frame. That is why such case frames find a lot of application in natural language understanding. So, <coughs> as I said, we were describing now frame knowledge representation is a good way to represent some common sense and we can define some stereotypical uh, aspects of that um, using frames and sentences about that domain can be parsed and their meaning can be extracted in terms of what the frames expect, all right, because this is important, what the frames expect. Um, say I am in a scenario where say again I take the case eat, all right. I have got all the possible slots what, who, with what, where, etcetera. Now, each of these slots have got an expectation that 
eating will so who eats this part whatever value fills it up from a sentence that has to be an animate object okay so if i say the um, I cannot just say the spaghetti ate uh, Mary, because spaghetti is an inanimate object. What eating? This must be an inanimate object. So, we know what is expected over here and this helps in resolving some of the ambiguities, all right, where we expect a place here. So, that should be some sort of a proper noun, all right. We expect some noun phrase here. With what? We expect some instrument or some inanimate object here, or it can be also if it is an animate object, in that case, that will relate to who? Say, Mary ate something, say spaghetti with John. Now, since John is inanimate, uh, John is animate, then obviously the relationship will not will be with who. That means the meaning will be this will no longer be an instrument, but will be a co-agent. The agent of eating is Mary, and John was with him, so that is a co-agent. In that way, we with looking at these possible constraints and the types of values that are filling up these blanks, we can approach towards better understanding of the sentences. <coughs> so, as we are showing that these case frames are being built around the verb phases. So, we start with the actions that is the activity of the sentence by the verb phase and the thematic role. All these cases that I was showing are essen also uh, mentioned as thematic roles. The different words in a sentence have got a role to play in that entire sentence, any sentence. It is a very interesting way of saying that say an end, any sentence that I state builds up a picture, right. It you can think of different way I make a sentence and if there was an expert artist probably he would have drawn that on the can canvas immediately. So, that instead of listening to the sentence, I can look at that picture and understand the same thing. The other thing is that whenever I state a sentence, if I have got a good semantic net type of structure, that sentence, if I understand that sentence, the proper nodes of that semantic net will be activated. Okay, that is another way of looking at it. So, whenever I I am just saying in a different way, whenever I say a sentence that is that can always be enacted. So, there can be different, I always talk about a theme and any theme will have different roles. Every component, every word of the sentence plays a particular role in that drama that the sentence picturizes. Okay. Typical uh, thematic roles are for the time being assume that whatever slots we are showing, who, what, these are different thematic roles and these are to be filled by a sentence. And the task is to determine the thematic roles of the noun phrases. Now, there are many theories that define uh, different semantic, uh, thematic roles. However, the common objective is to understand the sentence. Typically, the although it is not complete, in Indian languages when we work, then we may have a different structure, a uh, little bit extension of the thematic roles, but these are more or less standard. Agent, agent is the passive or active entity that causes an action. For example, the sentence Donald kicked the ball. Okay. So, Donald is the agent, co-agent is the partner with agent. For example, Donald kicked the ball with friend Mickey. All right. So, here Mickey is a co-agent. There is a thematic object. What? Donald kicked what? 
kick the ball. That is the object undergoing change. Often another way of looking at it is that any sentence, if I enact it, that will create a state change. Donald kicked the ball. So, the ball moved from one place to another. So, the overall state changed. That is also a very interesting way of looking at the whole thing. So, the object that is undergoing change is a thematic object. Instrument is a tool used by the agent like Donald kicked the ball with his foot. Location is another thematic role where action, the place where action occurred, Donald kicked the ball on the field. And in this way, we can go on uh, adding thematic roles. Now, let us look at this diagram. Again, here the verb is give. Who is giving? The kind man gave a bread to the beggar for his hungry child. So, giving, I start with giving, that is a past tense. Who gives? The kind man. So, the agent slot, the agent role is filled with the kind man. To whom? Who is participating in the action? The beggar that fills up the co-agent or the beneficiary. It is not exactly a co-agent, it is a beneficiary, the beggar. Give what? That is the theme, all right? So, the bread fills up here, the beggar comes up here. Uh, or sometimes we may like to put the beggar, gave the bread to the beggar, that is a co-agent and for his hungry child who will be ultimately benefited, the hungry child will fill up here. And when the time, the time is not specified. Now, if we fill up this frame, so you see here that with this sentence has not filled up all the possible frames. So, a partial instantiation of the frame is possible. And different verbs can have different frames. I am just showing the verb give. The domain of the role is dependent on the verb. All right. Now, a role can be a single concept or a composition based on a qualifier, qualified structure like here. The kind man, the agent part is being filled up with this entire structure, the kind man. It is not only the man, but it is a qualified. So, it is not a word, but a structure, right? So, it is a, it is not a single concept, but a composition. Now, once this is filled up, it is partially filled up, because this sentence does not talk about the time. Okay? So, if we look at this frame, then we can uh, answer a couple of questions, like who gave? the bread, obviously the answer will be the agent. Why? Now, I am asking a difficult question. Why did the kind, why did the kind man give the bread to the beggar? The answer will be the beneficiary. Who is the beneficiary? For his hungry child. So, at least to a particular level, we can answer some of the queries corresponding to this. So, you can, you are, uh, I would uh, encourage you to uh, take down this sentence, Robbie made coffee for Susie with a percolator. You can make a case frame structure for make, now this, this is made. I will just give you a hint. Now, make, make means making a thing. Okay? He made a toy and make coffee, that means prepare coffee. So, you see the verb make can have multiple frames, making coffee and making a machine, okay, making noise. Okay, the child made noise. In that case, the frame of make will change. So, you have to make an appropriate frame for the particular semantics of the verb and then parse this sentence and fill up the thematic roles manually and you will see that you will be able to answer some of the questions. Now, this is just the tip of the iceberg. Natural language understanding is a very interesting and very deep issue and subject and area of research. 
So, it is not possible to describe everything here, but my objective was to uh, introduce the idea to you and I will encourage you to uh, read about this more if you take up artificial intelligence for further studies. Natural language processing is a growing field and as I said before I conclude, I should repeat that natural language uh, research is a very important uh, area, especially for countries like India where we live among the multilingual community. Thank you.